right. So what are Browning bridge movement models to start off? So dynamic Browning bridge movement models are a particular type or extension of Browning bridge movement models. But I think it's good to define what these even are to begin with. Um, and they've, I think, been used for a couple other different contexts, but at least with respect to animal movement and space use. Um, they were kind of initially proposed by Horn and colleagues in 2007. So again, some definitions. The Brownian Bridge Movement Model, or BBMM, is based on the properties of a conditional random walk between successive pairs of locations. And these are dependent on the time between the locations, the distance between the locations, and the Brownian motion variance as related to animal's mobility. Um, so there's a kind of a lot of things going on here in this statements. Um, so a conditional random walk, meaning it's conditional between two sets of points. So if you look at this figure on the right, um, for this example, between these two observations denoted by A and B, where these peaks are in this uh, probability density surface, um, we're assuming that there's a random walk occurring between these two points, but we're not considering any other points that are before or after A and B, although there can be potentially a point in between them. Um, and we're also accounting for the time it takes to travel from A to B, um, as well as the distance between these two locations. And a lot of times we also will even consider the uh, location error associated with these points. And then this variance, so the spread of these contours away from this straight path that connects them is our Brownian motion variance. Um, so this is related to the animal's mobility meaning that the faster and more directed they're moving, the tighter this will be, whereas if they're moving more slowly, the more broad and diffuse these contours or isoplets would be. Um, so in general, for a Brownian bridge movement model, there's considered to be a single value, this Brownian motion variance. And as you'll recognize the term Brownian, similar to what we used when we referred to the continuous time random walk yesterday for behavioral state estimation, Brownian models are essentially continuous time random walks. So there's no correlation or directional persistence involved. It's just a diffusive process through space. Um, so another comment made in this paper by Horn and colleagues makes a slightly different definition for describing this, this model in that a Brownian bridge is a continuous time stochastic model of movement in which the probability of being in an area is conditioned on starting and ending locations, the elapsed time between those points, and the mobility or speed of movement. Um, so it's somewhat similar to this first definition, but we're also including some components here that it's a continuous time stochastic model. So related to its continuous time, so we have this Brownian motion or diffusion process um, occurring randomly through time between these sets of points conditionally. And we're accounting for this time difference and the space between them and the speed essentially of this, this movement. Um, so I denote here this variable sig or parameter sigma squared M is our Brownian motion variance. And a paper by Cranstauber and colleagues um, in 2012 defines this as the recent introduction the recent introduction of Brownian bridge movement models improves on the traditional UD statistics by incorporating the temporal structure of tracking data and explicitly modeling the movement path by incorporating both the order of locations and the amount of time between them. Um, so kind of showing how this this model may show an improvement um, in estimating UDs by comparison to other more traditional metrics such as kernel density estimation. Um, which might not account for this temporal structure or for um, this like movement speed between successive observations along a track, since it assumes implicit or explicitly that they're independent of one another and identically distributed. Um, however, there can be some potential issues with Brownian bridge movement models as they are originally. So like I mentioned, there's no directional persistence in this underlying model is just a general random walk, like Brownian diffusive process from point A to point B. 
Um, and it's only connecting two points via this process. So we can see this kind of play out here in this figure from Horn et al. 2007, where it's connecting every other point together. Um, so we see this kind of overall ellipse connecting points at time zero, T zero to time T two, um, and time T one actually falls outside of this contour. And then it goes from time T two to T four and T three kind of falls within it. And then from T four to T six, um, and we see that the width or the Brownian motion Brownian motion variance is slightly different from time uh, step or contour to contour in this case. Um, however, the original Brownian bridge movement model assumes a homogeneous movement behavioral pattern across the full duration of the track, um, meaning that it estimates the Brownian motion variance and uses a single value to um, produce these utilization distribution estimates across the entire path. So um, it doesn't have separate estimates based on changes in speed or directional persistence. Um, so it may not capture these dynamic processes of things such as behavioral shifts. And this can result in imprecision of the estimated UD or the estimated space use for animals. So an extension of the originally proposed Brownian bridge movement model is what's called the dynamic Brownian bridge movement model or DBBMM. Um, and this is proposed to estimate the Brownian motion variance for different behavioral segments of tracks. And this might sound familiar. So this model is considering segmenting a track into different behavioral periods of homogeneous behavior and having a different Brownian motion variance value for each segment. Um, And this should actually say Grant Grant Stauber 2012. Um, so this is this segmentation is performed using the behavioral change point analysis proposed originally by Garari and colleagues from 2012, I believe, also. Um, but it's a slight mo modification of this method. And this is what's used to estimate these behavioral shifts. So it's trying to identify these breakpoints in time that separate these tracks to estimate. Um, different Brownian motion variance values that characterize them. Um, and this is expected to improve the estimates of occurrence distributions for animal movements. So we can see here on the right, a, a figure from this Kronstauber et al. 2012 paper, where they show this comparison between the original Brownian bridge movement model and a dynamic version um, for a, a fissure that was tagged in New York. Um, so we see the different isoplets here, the 50% to 95% contours, and then the underlying track or path underneath. And this square is zooming in on the actual um, raster layer, essentially, of this utilization distribution. And you can see how these, these points or this, these raster grid cells are relatively diffuse in their intensity um, and quite large in some cases. But by comparison for the dynamic version, um, the underlying track here is color coded where the bluer or cooler colors denote uh, smaller values of the Brownian motion variance and the warmer colors that are more red uh, are higher values. And if we look at this inset here of this raster layer, by comparison to the Brownian bridge model, the original version, um, the intensity has increased. So the, the points are smaller, but they're darker generally. So um, there are some periods or locations where they are relatively softer looking and diffuse, but this is attributed to these different Brownian motion variance values for different parts of the track. Um, and they propose in this paper that you can even use these changes in Brownian motion variance to estimate um, essentially these behavioral shifts over time um, although this is much more difficult to interpret by comparison to um, the behavioral state estimation models we covered yesterday. Um, but showing here that the Brownian motion variance is high at night, um, and that's because this fissure is more active at night. So there's a lot of different movement patterns that are happening, whereas during the day it's resting. Um, so the variance is very low. Um, and there's a number of 
different user defined parameters that you need to supply the dynamic Brownian bridge movement model to get it working. Um, and these can be relatively subjective in some cases. So I'm gonna provide some tips or guidelines as to what might work best. This is gonna be highly dependent per data set or species. So um, I'm not gonna give any real like values you should be using. Although this paper does propose some ranges of values that may be useful. Um, so one thing you should or need to provide is the telemetry error for each observation. So this method accounts directly for the error in your locations. Um, so if you're using GPS, a lot of times the assumed error is about 30 meters. Um, whereas for Argos tags, obviously it's much larger. But if you do, let's say what we did, where you um, process your tracks using a state-based model, and then you have these processed locations, um, it's nice that foie gras returns the standard errors associated with the X and the Y dimension or coordinates. And we can use those errors to feed into this model. Um, so you can either supply a single value, which is applied across all observations, um, or you can give a separate or unique value per observation. Um, one of the parameters you need to define up front is the sliding window size. And this is um, a component of that behavioral change point analysis where it moves a sliding window across the time series of the track to identify these breakpoints. And this is denoted by this parameter W. Um, and in general, this window size should be larger than two times M, which is the margin size. So we have our sliding window moving across the track. Um, but in addition to this sliding window, we have what's called the margin, which is essentially the uh, starting and ending period of the window itself. Um, and this margin basically holds out observations that won't be used to estimate breakpoints. So um, if you set a margin size to some value, let's say it's three, it needs to be at least a value of three. Um, it's gonna add, it's gonna remove three observations from consideration at the beginning of that window, as well as three from the end of the window. So you need to have at least more than two times that um, in your window size to be able to even estimate a, a breakpoint. Um, and uh, I thought I had a note on it here, but um, you need to make sure also that the, the sliding window size and the margin size are both odd numbers because of how this model is working. So if the minimum window size needs to be at least two times greater than the margin size, let's say you leave your margin size at this minimum value of three. If you did two times three, that's six, but because the window size needs to be odd, it needs to at least be seven, although that only leaves one value to be estimated for breakpoints. So ideally you want the margin size, two times the margin size to be maybe at most a half of the size of your window, your sliding window. Um, but again, this is somewhat subjective depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and here's an example of a figure from this, this paper proposing this method where they're looking at different uh, windows in relation to a breakpoint here in red, and then using the Bayesian information criteria to uh, decide where they should place a, a breakpoint that um, basically increases the likelihood or is the best fit for this section of the track potentially based on the provided window size and margin size. Um, so how to select the window size and margin size. So just some general overall suggestions, but again, no hard, fast like numbers necessarily. Um, but by increasing the window size, you're increasing the reliability of your estimates of this Brownian motion variance term. Um, however, the trade-off is this is at the cost of potentially missing these rapid changes or shifts in behavior. Um, so if you think there are some rapid shifts occurring in your data sets, then maybe you don't wanna make this, that, this window size too large. Um, but if you think these changes are happening more gradually, it's probably not as big of an issue. Um, by comparison, if you increase the margin size, this increases the likelihood of identifying relatively weak breakpoints 
that may not be detected with um, smaller values of these margin sizes. However, this comes at the cost of potentially not detecting breakpoints due to the limited observations available within your sliding window, because um, the margin size basically removes observations from consideration as potential breakpoints. So the larger that or yeah, the larger that ratio is from your window size to margin size, the fewer breakpoints you can potentially detect. So the choices for your window size and margin size should be determined by the time interval over which biologically relevant behavioral changes are expected to occur. So if you think changes might be occurring over the span of a couple hours, that will also be dictated by the time interval over which your, your tags are transmitting. Um, whereas if you think there might be like daily changes, maybe you wanna make your window size, um, the number of observations uh, transmitted in, in a day per day. Um, optionally, this could be up to several days or a week or more. Um, this is highly dependent on the sampling frequency of your tags. And um, we have this uh, figure here again from this Kronstauber paper on the right, where they uh, tested different values of this window size and margin size for an empirical data sets. Um, oh, and I have one last bullet saying that these values will vary, yeah, again, depending on the time interval. So this is for both acoustic or satellite telemetry. Um, but this figure on the right is showing this essentially like raster density surface where the darker the color, um, the greater the likelihood or the better fit of the model, this Brownian bridge model. So anything where these window sizes for this particular data set are between like 30 and 50 and have a margin size from like five to 15 or 20 tended to produce very good estimates, but um, this might not necessarily hold well for your data set. So you could potentially test out something like this um, with different combinations of window size and margin size. Otherwise, you should always keep in mind that you want these values to be biologically relevant and um, related to the time interval of your data set. Um, so lastly, to provide some motivating examples of what some of these results may look like. Um, so for this, uh, I forget if it's, I think it's a stork um, from Europe that's migrating south along eventually here, the, the Nile River into Africa. Um, we have these different segments of the track that are highlighted. And it's a comparison between the Brownian bridge uh, model the original version versus the dynamic version. So on the left side, we see the track and then the contours for the utilization distribution based on the original Brownian bridge model. Um, and we see that during this migratory phase, you don't even see any utilization distribution contours there essentially because they're either non existent or they're so small that they're tightly hugging the track itself. Um, and once it reaches this foraging area at the end of its this path. Um, it's a relatively broader contour, set of contours here. By comparison, the dynamic model has larger contours around these uh, migratory periods because there's higher Brownian motion variance. So there's multiple paths that connect these two points together um, that may be to the left, to the right of the actual observed track. And then um, on the bottom, once it reaches that foraging area, these contours uh, hug this set of points a bit more tightly by comparison compared to the, the original method. Um, this recent paper by Patricio and colleagues from this past year, look at the movements of green turtles um, in West Africa and are trying to highlight these, these corridors of movement basically along the coastline. Um, so estimated um, the percentage of different migratory routes or paths along the, the span of multiple countries here. And then the uh, basically the probability greater than 25% that we're seeing these, these hot spots essentially of corridor use are denoted by these red polygons here on the right side. Um, so showing that you could potentially use this method to identify corridors of space use or movement. 
And then lastly, these are also used in different marine settings, um, especially within estuaries. Um, so this, this paper by Yuri Niella and colleagues from a couple of years ago, showing the use of um, dynamic Browning bridge movement models for acoustic telemetry data um, and using this to estimate space use of bull sharks in this case um, within an estuary in Australia. So there's a number of different ways you can apply these, this method to estimating space use for different purposes. All right, so with that, we can move on to actually calculating the, these models.